Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, salam, and thank you for being with us today for our talk on Muslims in the Balkans, on the edges of Islam and Europe with Dr. Arwin Sinanovic. My name is Aliyah Khan, and I'm the director of the University of Michigan Global Islamic Studies Center, your host today. I'm also an associate professor in the Department of English and the Department of Afro-American and African Studies. First, a little about us. The Global Islamic Studies Center aims to promote the understanding of global Islamic culture and Muslim societies worldwide, not just the Middle East, but Asia, Africa, and the Americas. If you're a Michigan student wanting to get involved with our center, please attend our events. But also, if you are an undergraduate student, declare our Islamic studies minor. The minor itself has no prerequisites and it's 16 credits. You can find out more information on our minor page and our website, but please reach out and contact us and we'll make sure you have everything you need to declare. If you are interested in graduate programs in Islamic studies, check out our masters in international and regional studies with an Islamic studies specialization. The application deadline is mid-December and you can also find more information on our website. The master's program is 36 credits total and is usually pursued over the course of two years. If you are a student, faculty, staff, or community member interested in our events, make sure to join our newsletter. We send out, we send out monthly newsletters and you can subscribe at the link on your screen and a link that will be in the chat. This semester, we just finished our fourth annual Halloween Muslim Horror Film Festival, featuring horror films from Malaysia, Indonesia, Senegal, and Turkey. And the festival was covered in Religion News, American Muslim Today, and other media outlets. The Global Islamic Studies Center has one final event coming up this semester. On November 29th, in collaboration with the Latin American and Caribbean Studies Center at U of M, we're featuring a religion and feminism interfaith author roundtable, where we'll be talking about the intersection of feminism with Catholicism, Islam, and Judaism. This event will launch just published books by one by Dr. William Calvo Quiros entitled Undocumented Saints. The politics, Undocumented Saints, the politics of migrating devotions and a book by Dr. Jocelyn Fenton Stitt entitled Dreams of Archives Unfolded, Absence and Caribbean Life Writing. I'll also be talking about my recent book, Far From Mecca, Globalizing the Muslim Caribbean. Ken Chitwood, author of the book, The Muslims of Latin America and the Caribbean, will be moderating. Next semester, we have two exciting events to look forward to. Our very first African Muslim Film Festival featuring films curated from Sudan, Chad, South Africa, Egypt, and more. In early March, we'll also be launching a new book by Dr. Charlotte Karam Albrecht, a faculty member at U of M, entitled Possible Histories, Arab Americans and the Queer Ecology of Peddling. So today I'd like to thank, or first like to thank our generous co-sponsors. This talk on Muslims in the Balkans is brought to you by the Global Islamic Studies Center and co-sponsored at the University of Michigan by the Department of Slavic Languages and Literatures, the Center for Russian, Eastern European, and Eurasian Studies, and the Weiser Center for Europe and Eurasia. It is also co-sponsored by the Center for Islam in the Contemporary World at Shenandoah University, of which Dr. Sinanovic is director. I'm very pleased to say that this is the first time we at Global Islamic Studies have worked on an event with all of the Eastern European Studies units at the University of Michigan, and I'm really looking forward to having that relationship continue. Make sure, again, that you keep up with Michigan Global Islamic Studies and all of our events by signing up for our newsletter, and definitely follow us on Twitter and Facebook. But on to the main event. Today, I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Ermin Sinanovic virtually to the University of Michigan. Dr. Sinanovic is the Executive Director of the Center for Islam in the Contemporary World at Shenandoah University in Virginia, where he is also a scholar in residence. He is a political scientist and scholar of Islam 
who is passionate about studying the comparative politics of Muslim societies. His research is on transnational Islamic revival, contemporary Islamic thought, and the institutionalization of Islam in the Balkans and Southeast Asia. Ermin speaks Bosnian, English, Arabic, and Malay. A lot of languages that are very different. At the end of the talk, uh, we'll have time for Q&A from the audience. Your mics are muted for this webinar, so please make sure to submit your questions using the Q&A icon on the bottom of the screen. Ermin, it's always a pleasure to talk to and learn from you, so I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Khan Alia, for this wonderful introduction. Uh, good afternoon. Hello, everybody. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, it's such an honor and pleasure to be here with you today, and uh, I'm also very honored to be part of this series at the University of Michigan's Global Islamic Studies Center. I'm also glad that I've, I was the reason that uh, all these different centers at the University of Michigan came together. So anytime you need them to talk together, I'll be available to bring them to bring them together. Um, the topic that we have in front of us today is, um, I think, a topic that a lot of times people do not know much about or do not pay attention to when they talk about global Islam. And that is about Muslims in the Balkans. And I have titled this talk that um, Muslims on the Balkans on the margins of Islam in Europe or the Muslim world in Europe. Because both geographically, historically, they have been considered to be on the periphery. Even though I will, during my talk, try to make an argument uh, that we should do away with this kind of center periphery understanding of the Muslim world. So I'm going to um, share my screen, which I hope you all uh, can see. And I'll be using this presentation now. Um, so once again, the title of the talk is The Muslims in the Balkans on the Edges of Islam in Europe. Um, the, um, the image that you see on the right side of your screen is the image I took about a few years ago in Sarajevo, the capital of Bosnia-Herzegovina. And so even though my talk is uh, titled about Muslims in the Balkans, much of my presentation is going to use Bosnia and Herzegovina as the case study because it is the country that I know the best in the Balkans that I have studied uh, and that also I am from. Well, that's where I was born and where I grew up. Um, you can also find here uh, the uh, website of our center at Shenandoah University, as well as my email in case you want to reach out for any kind of questions related to Islam in the Balkans, and I'd be happy to respond to you. So I'll start with some geography, because I think it's very important, given that we probably have a very diverse audience, and they may not always have um, you know, the geographical representation of what we're talking about fully. And I think it's it's good to start with that. So here in front of us is basically Europe. And Europe, geographically speaking, uh, has four peninsulas. It has in the north the Scandinavian peninsula. and the south, it has three peninsulas. In the southwest is uh, the, the Pyrenees Peninsula. And then uh, where Italy is located, that's the Apennine Peninsula. And then the Balkans, where you find, or sometimes called more politically correct, if you will, Southeastern Europe. And that's the region that we are focusing on, uh, where you can find uh, many uh, countries. And that's uh, the region that's, um, that's uh, the main topic of our conversation today. So that's a kind of a big picture. If we try to zoom in now, this is what we are talking about geographically. Um, most people would agree that these countries are the countries of the Balkans. Uh, some people would not perhaps want to be called the Balkan countries, maybe Slovenians, perhaps even Croatians would sometimes try to consider themselves part of the Central Europe. But historically, this region is what constitutes the Balkans. It includes uh, Greece and also parts of Turkey as well. Um, so that was kind of zoom out and zoom in geographical approach. And the third map that I'm going to show and I think is also important is the historical spread of the Ottoman Empire 
into the Balkans because we owe to a large extent the presence of Muslims in that region to the historical spread of the Ottoman Empire. Yes, the Muslims existed in what is uh, the Balkans, uh, what we consider to be the Balkans today. They historically existed in that part of the world even before the Ottomans, but those are much smaller communities. It is really with the expansion of the Ottoman Empire, and this map shows you how historically it went in stages, uh, especially going toward Europe all the way to almost reaching Vienna, basically. Um, you can see from this map how uh, the Ottoman Empire spread into Europe, especially in the Balkans. And with the Ottoman Empire, Islam spread as well. Uh, many of the local people converted to Islam, they became Muslims um, and continued uh, in that way for many centuries until, until today. And we owe the presence of the Muslims in that part of the world to a large extent to the expansion of the Ottoman Empire. All right, so that's kind of basic geography, which I really wanted to cover so that we all understand which part of the world we're talking about, what are the countries that we are discussing uh, before we zoom in into, um, you know, much more on Bosnia and Herzegovina, but also not forgetting other countries of the Balkans and the Muslims there. So I'll start with some basic methodological consideration. This is probably going to be the most academic scholarly part of my presentation, but it's something that I need to do. Um, oftentimes, if you look for books on Islam in Europe, what you will find very frequently is that uh, there are many contemporary studies on Islam in Europe that neglect or minimize the presence and importance of Islam and Muslims in the Balkans. So oftentimes when people talk about Islam in Europe, they would be talking about Islam in Western Europe, in Germany, in France, in Italy, in Spain, in the UK, and other countries. Uh, and you would be going through the contents of the book, trying to see if they would include a few case studies from the Balkans. And a lot of times you would find, you would not find a single case study from the Balkans. Sometimes you would find one or two, but they would be dwarfed by the attention that has been given to the presence of Islam in Western Europe. And this is what I call neglected geographies. I think um, these uh, neglected geographies have contributed to our understanding of Islam, globally speaking, as having center and periphery. The neglected geographies include areas such as Southeast Asia, Indonesia and Malaysia. Indonesia, for instance, being the most populous Muslim country in the world, and yet often it receives very little attention. Uh, many other countries of the world are treated similarly. West Africa is only recently, I think, uh, has started to re uh, receiving some attention. Uh, Muslims in South Africa, in many of these borderline areas are often neglected. So that's what I call as neglected geographies. And um, so again, the picture, uh, a lot of these pictures that I will show in the presentation, uh, I took myself, I just came back from Bosnia two days ago, and I took this picture just a week ago. This is um, the main mosque, the most important, the most famous mosque in Sarajevo. It's called the Gazi Husrebeg Mosque. And next to it is the uh, the clock tower that still until today uh, shows time what is known as Ala Turka, which is um, it uses Arabic numerals. Uh, and the day begins at Maghrib or at the sunset. So at sunset time, when you hear the call for prayer and you look up at the clock tower, you will see 12 o'clock. So totally different a calculation of time. And it's probably one of the few remaining such lunar clocks in the world. It requires um, maintenance and all kinds of different things. The building uh, left to, uh, to the tower clock is the Medrasa. Uh, Gazi Husabek Medras in Saraya, which is a high school, uh, and it's for centuries trained imams, Muslim scholars. Uh, it was established in 1531 of 37. Um, so it's almost 500 years old now. So that was that's a fresh picture right there. Um, so the cure for these neglected geographies that I uh, that I'm talking about. 
um, is what I called Islam on the edges. I'm not the first one to suggest this, but what I am arguing for, uh, our center has adopted this as one of its research programs, and we are working together with uh, the Abu Suleiman Center for Global Islamic Studies at George Mason University to develop this even further. I also host a podcast called Islam on the Edges, uh, and I think the link to that podcast has been shared in, in chat. And what I, I'm trying to showcase is that Islam on the Edges is Islam full of dynamism, uniqueness, innovativeness, and adaptation. Um, it's not some kind of ossified, filtered down um, Islam, but it's an Islam that is orthodox. It is Islam that is uh, full of dynamism. And sometimes you can find the most uh, interesting developments in Islamic thought, in culture, and other areas in which Islam is manifested in Islam on the edges. So I'm just going to uh, read a few sentences from sort of my methodological approach to Islam on the edges. Uh, and that's the only thing I really am going to read, you know, in a, in a boring conference style fashion. So Islam on the edges, if understood as a methodological principle, could yield new insights into understanding the global nature of Islam. While there has been a significant development in the approaches to the study of Islam, emphasizing its global and non-centric nature, there are still significant remnants of the old approaches that seem to emphasize the centrality of the Middle East, uh, Middle Eastern and Near Eastern studies, uh, histories, languages, and cultures. Such approaches may be understandable, but their presence in today's globalized uh, world ought to be brought into question. Islam on the edges is both polycentric and non-centric in nature. It invites us to think of multiple important centers of Muslim culture and religious experience. In its polycentric nature, Islam on the edges imparts a non-centric understanding of Muslim religion. No center or region is more important to the understanding of global Islam than another. But the geographically oriented manifestations are not the only area of concern for the methodological insights derived from Islam on the edges. This research program can also be understood as history, theology, memory, or culture, among other things. Islam on the edges invites us to reimagine the map of Islam by destabilizing the already existing categories and by recentering the edges. Such a move is cognitive, hermeneutical, and heuristic at the same time. It is cognitive because it rewires our brain to think in new ways, cre creating new avenues for research and inquiry. It is hermeneutical too, for our understanding of religious texts is always informed by the concomitant geographies and histories. The heuristic aspect calls us to look at the empirics of lived ex uh, empirics of lived experiences, not just the texts, and always be open to new understandings and insights. So these short paragraphs are really the kind of guiding torchlight, if you will, that I use in trying to understand Islam on the edges that highlight its importance for our understanding of global Islam. Um, so. Based on this um, and using this as a background and, and methodological approach, I'm going to now zoom in on Muslims of the Balkans uh, and use Bosnia-Herzegovina as a case study to showcase some of the ideas that I have about understanding Muslims uh, in the Balkans. So I already talked about these neglected geographies. Uh, if you look here, just a few examples, and uh, I could have found, actually, I did find many more, but I didn't want to bump bombard you with this. So here are some um, uh, contents from some books on Islam in Europe. And you can see here on the left side, uh, talks about Islam in France and Germany in the United Kingdom. And then it says Islam in Europe, past, present, and future. And when I check the book, there is very little to no mention of Muslims in the Balkans, even though they are the longest standing Muslim uh, communities in Europe. Um, in another book, you find the case studies of major Muslim thinkers. And again, you find nobody from the Balkans. Um, the Pew Research Center here, you have a survey about Muslims in Europe. 
And again, you find several countries in the Balkans completely left out of those considerations. Um, I could go on and on, but there are many such examples. And a lot of times today, when I see a new book on Islam in Europe, and I open the contents and there is nothing on the Balkans, I sometimes don't even wish to read the book because I feel that such an important Muslim community or Muslim communities in Europe have been completely left out of, of, of contemporary understanding when people talk about Islam in Europe. Um, let's now look at some basic data. Uh, here are the demographics of Muslims in Eastern Europe. This includes also countries that are not the Balkans countries, but I included them so that we can have some comparison. And I have put the asterisk next to the uh, countries that are usually considered to be the Balkans countries. So you can see that in Eastern Europe, out of the population of about 300 million, there are 22 million Muslims, which is about 7.4% of the total population. Um, in the Balkans alone, we have about seven to eight million Muslims. Uh, Russia is the largest Muslim population in Eastern Europe. Uh, here, according to data that I looked at, I found different projections between 14 to 20 million but most of the people would assume that there are about 17 to 18 million of Muslims in Russia, which makes it the largest Muslim population in Eastern Europe. Um, looking from another perspective, there are three majority Muslim countries in Eastern Europe. They are all in the Balkans. Kosovo, where about 95% of the population is Muslim. Albania, where you know the number that I got was 59%. I've even heard 54% definitely over 50%. And then Bosnia and Herzegovina were slightly just over half of the population is Muslim. And then in other countries in the Balkans, like in Montenegro, there is a sizable Muslim minority, almost 20%. In Bulgaria, about 10% of the population is Muslim. In North Macedonia, about 33, one third of the population is Muslim. Um, so you can see from here that the number of Muslims varies from country to country, but in many of these countries, they are often the, the largest non-Christian minority. Uh, and in several countries, as I already had mentioned, they are a majority. So definitely a very important Muslim presence in the Balkans. And I would argue that this is more so the reason that we should pay attention to Islam in the Balkans. In addition to, of course, its longstanding presence and history, of which I will talk a little bit more in a few minutes. Um, just to compare with the rest of Europe, this is according to Pew Research Center. It's about 10 years old, but journal numbers still work. Uh, here is the estimated number of Muslims in Europe between 1990 all the way projected to 2030. And you can see how the uh, Muslim presence in Europe is expected to continue increasing in the future. Now, I would mention, maybe not as a footnote, but probably as a part of the main text here, is that um, demographics are not always something positive for the Muslims in the Balkans and in Europe to talk about, because demographics are often used against the Mus Muslims in Europe uh, by showcasing the number of Muslims in Europe and how that number is increasing. Uh, the perception is created of the Muslim threat in Europe. So, you know, look, there's, there was 30 million Muslims in 1990. There's going to be 60, almost 60 million Muslims in 2030. They are increasing. They're increasing in numbers. They're increasing in percentages. And we need to do something to stop that. That's the kind of rhetoric that you often hear, not only from right-wing parties in Europe, but often even from the centrist parties, they would express concern with the increased number of Muslims in the country. And we know that in the cases of the Muslims in the Balkans, especially in Bosnia and in Kosovo, one of the arguments that uh, Serbia had used in order to you know, attack Bosnia, Muslims in Bosnia and in Kosovo, was that their numbers in, are increasing, uh, they have higher birth rates than the Serbs, and over time they're going to overtake, and we have to do something now before their numbers is too large, you know, and, and basically we cannot, uh, it becomes impossible to deal with that. 
All right. So those are some of the basic background facts, you know, basic geography, basic history, uh, ba you know, demographics and numbers combined with my methodological approach. Now we're going to look into the Muslims in the Balkans and try to understand them a little bit better. So I would argue that uh, there are several, in this case, five shared characteristics of the Muslims in the Balkans. Number one, by and large, we're talking here about the minority context. And even the cases where Muslims represent a numerical majority, like for instance, in the case of Bosnia, their status and even their own behavior is often the status and behavior of a minority population. The second shared characteristic of, uh, of Muslims in the Balkans is that they have all lived, that they have all lived much of the 20th century, if not most of the 20th century, within a secular environment, especially after the World War II, when many of these countries have become communist countries, secularism really penetrated into Muslim communities in the Balkans and have changed the way in which these communities uh, interact with their history and tradition, as well as their current institutional presence in, uh, in the Balkans. The third aspect or the third shared characteristic is that pretty much all Muslims of the Balkans have the experience of living under communism or socialism. And that has created certain ways of dealing with religion that are peculiarly unique, I would say, to the Balkans that you wouldn't find in other parts uh, where Muslims live. The fourth aspect is the Ottoman heritage. I've already talked that Islam came by and large with the Ottoman expansion in the Balkans. And uh, for that reason, we find uh, very strongly the Ottoman heritage present among the uh, Muslims in the Balkans. That includes a theological orientation, which is predominantly Sunni, um, the following of the Hanafi school of jurisprudence, for instance, um, the widespread uh, presence of Sufi tariqas or Sufi orders um, in culture, in architecture, and in many other areas of life, the Ottoman heritage is the main way in which Muslims of the Balkans interact with Islam. And finally, um, the close contact with Christianity and especially with the Orthodox Christianity in most of these countries. Um, before the Ottomans moved into the Balkans, much of the Balkans were under the Byzantine Empire. Uh, the Western part of the Balkans that is today Slovenia and Croatia were not. Most of the rest was. And, and that's where the Orthodox Christianity was the most dominant religion. And so when, Muslim, when the Ottomans came and brought Islam and even local population converted to Islam, many people remained Christians. And part of the reason for that was because of the you know, Ottoman approach that they treated uh, the Christians and the Jews in a traditional Muslim way as the people of the book Ehl Kitab, uh, more specifically, uh, when the Ottomans conquered these areas, often they would sign some kind of treaties with local Christians, which also secured their right to continue professing their religion. Uh, of course, it wasn't all hunky-dory. It wasn't always perfect. It wasn't always great. But by and large, the Ottoman Empire in this particular aspect was probably more tolerant toward this Christian and Jewish population uh, than uh, we find even in Western Europe at the time toward the, the religious minorities that existed. And so because of this close contact with the Orthodox Christianity, there was a lot of interaction between the Orthodox Christianity and Islam. And you find it even in the architecture. Of course, uh, what we have in this slide is the, the picture of the famous Hagia Sophia the great uh, Byzantine Orthodox cathedral, which was after the, con the Ottoman conquest of Constantinople uh, was con converted into a mosque and it remained as a functioning mosque until the um, abolition of the caliphate by the Turkish Republican government led by Mustafa Kemal Atatürk and then Ayasofya 
was converted eventually into museum only to convert again into a mosque several years ago under the present government in Turkey. But if you look at the basic architecture of Hagia Sophia, you can say that it presented and, and other Byzantine churches have presented the template which the Ottomans have used in order to build the mosques with certain modifications, uh, but the main structure is very similar. So what you have often as, you know, in as our image of the mosque in the Ottoman world is really a modified Byzantine church. So that points to that close contact with the earth of Christianity. I've only used that one example. There are so many. And I would argue that across the Balkans, you'll find um, in the Muslim communities in the Balkans, they all share all these five characteristics, even though they may have certain uniqueness and way in, in way in which they approach each of these. So what are some of the relevant issues? I think one of the relevant issues is uh, the migration. Uh, I've used here the map of uh, Crimea and Ukraine, even though that's not in the Balkans, but I think it is important and it's relevant to today to global affairs today to show how the Muslims, not only in the Balkans, but in central, in Eastern and even Central Europe, had often, in starting from the 19th century, as the Ottoman Empire was weakening, and as there was a nationalistic kind of uprising among the uh, mostly Christian populations that were living under the Ottoman Empire. Many of these Christian populations started seeking their own independence, autonomy, uh, self-determination. And as a result, those uh, nationalistic ideologies have often been couched in the way they were being promulgated as quiet anti-Ottoman, which also meant quiet anti-Muslim. As a result, as these different populations were acquiring their independence, the Muslims of those regions suffered greatly. They were often pushed out. Oftentimes, great crimes had been com committed. And so after the Greek War of Independence in the 1820s, after the Crimean War in the 1850s, uh, then from the Balkans, starting in the 1870s, all the way into the early 20th century, there was a great movement of people, but also many, many pogroms, if you will, uh, that happened against Muslims in the Balkans and in wider Eastern Europe. The result of all of these changes and migrations was 5.5 million dead with about 5 million refugees. And if you look at this map that was um, made by Professor Justin McCarthy of the University of Louisville, who had studied this issue in depth, you'll find that millions and millions of Christian Muslims were displaced during that period. According to him, about 5 million Muslims and almost 2 million Christians. And if you look at the figure at the bottom of this uh, map, you'll find that uh, between 1864 and 1922, close to 5 million Muslims and 1 million Christians have died in these um, wars for self-determination, autonomy, and the nationalistic uprisings in the Balkans uh, against the Ottoman Empire. The net result of those rebellions, if you will, or those fights for independence was that number one, that the Ottoman territory shrank and eventually the Ottomans left the Balkans. And number two, that the Muslim population, most of which the vast majority of the Muslim population of the Balkans was indigenous population to the Balkans, suffered greatly either through killing or expulsion or through basically migration, trying to flee away from violence that was unleashed by these nationalistic wars. Um, the, uh, the numbers are sobering here when you look at it. And so even if you transpose this in the 20th century, in the 1990s, when uh, Yugoslavia, for instance, collapsed and the new independent republics, new independent states emerged out of it, Bosnia-Herzegovina uh, was attacked by Serbia. And, uh, and as a result, the Muslims of Bosnia-Herzegovina suffered greatly. And in a way, you 
can find the historical continuity between what started already toward the end of the 18th century all the way into 19th century and the 20th century. If you look at the maps of where Muslims lived in the 19th century, for instance, and where they live today, you'll find that the geographical presence of the Muslims in the Balkans has shrank considerably. And uh, so they were pushed into smaller, smaller enclaves and territories as the nationalistic fervor continued building local nationalisms that were often uh, that often had very strong anti-Muslim elements built into it. So other relevant issues. As a result of all these historical changes with the Ottomans retreating from the Balkans and the Muslims now living under new governments that are not Muslim governments, the, que the basic questions uh, started being asked, for instance, should the Muslims even stay living under a non-Muslim rule? And there was a lot of debate, for instance, in Bosnia and Herzegovina after the Austro-Hungarian Empire occupied Bosnia in 1878, when the Ottomans ceded Bosnia to the Austro-Hungarians, um, you know, because of the wars that happened in Russia um, and the, the territories, you know, trade of territories that happened at, at the Berlin Congress in 1878, the Muslims started asking questions, should we even stay here? Should we live under a non-Muslim rule? Because for several centuries, they lived in the Ottoman Empire, which was a Muslim state. It had Muslim administration. It provided support for schools, for madrasas, for al-Kaf, uh, endowments, for mosques, for the imams, for the muftis, and all the other things. And uh, there were a number of fatwa or fatwas or religious rulings that had that had been issued by Muslim scholars in Bosnia. Uh, some advocating that Muslims should migrate and leave, others advocating that they should stay because this is their country, this is their land, this is where they're from. Um, hundreds of thousands migrated to the Ottoman Empire, but most of the people stayed in the areas where they lived. And that seemed to have become the most prevalent opinion. They also started living under constitutional governments. Uh, they were introduced to modern ideologies later on, you know, communism, socialism. Um, and here on the left, you have a proclamation, which is also a fatwa by Raisul Alama, or that is to say, the chief mufti of Bosnia, Jamaluddin Chaushevich, in 1914, when the World War I started and the Muslims were conscripted into the Austro Hungarian Empire and its military. The question was, should the Muslim soldiers fast in the month of Ramadan? You know, fasting Ramadan is one of the pillars of Islamic faith. And basically his argument was that if they are subject to, you know, difficult work and, you know, war operations and so on, that they would be exempt from fasting but of course they should make up those days later on when they are capable of doing so. Um, so we're he here having a situation where you have Muslim soldiers in the Austro-Hungarian empire, a European power, uh, trying to find ways and accommodations for their religious practices. And actually the Austro-Hungarians accommodated those practices uh, during the World War I. Um, and the Sharia courts that existed during the Ottoman times continued not only through the Austro-Hungarian times, you know, Austro-Hungarians were on the losing side in the World War I, um, then the, the kingdom of the Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes was constituted, later renamed the kingdom of Yugoslavia, and the Sharia courts survived all those different arrangements they were finally abolished uh, by the communist government that was established in post-World War II Yugoslavia in 1946. So up until 1946, there were actually functioning Sharia courts, Islamic law courts. They were limited to mostly family matters, divorce, marriage, inheritance. Uh, but these Sharia courts continued until 1946. So 
you can conclude that you have a situation where Islamic courts existed in Europe until about 75 years ago. And that's quite remarkable when you think about it. Um, when it comes to culture, there was already indigenous culture that existed in the Balkans prior to the coming of Islam, of course. There were also religious practices that included Christianity, but also some remnants of pagan practices and so on. Uh, all of that gave rise eventually to something that in Bosnia today is called the Islamic tradition of Bosniaks. Uh, the person that was most responsible for coming up with this formulation was the late Professor Fikrat Kartic, who passed away just several months ago, uh, earlier this year. Um, and uh, he was definitely one of the most prominent contemporary Muslim scholars in the Balkans. Actually, if you want to learn about Islam in the Balkans, just Google him up, find his works, uh, and he's published quite a bit in English. And you can get a pretty good picture about Islam in the Balkans in general. So what he has argued is that as a result of this long lived tradition of Islam among the Muslims in Bosnia, um, and I would say that most of these apply probably to most of the other Muslim communities in the Balkans, there appeared, there emerged the Islamic tradition of Bosniaks that includes six elements. First, it is primarily Ahlus Sunnah or the Sunni because that was the dominant theological school of the Ottomans. Second, that it includes Ottoman Islamic culture. Third, uh, third that it includes the Islamized practices of pre-Ottoman Bosnia. Uh, such, for instance, we have this phenomenon that we call Dovishta. These were places uh, that were places for prayer before people became Muslims. They would go to certain mountains, or certain areas where they would go under the under the sky and they would have prayers and so on. Those practices continued after they became Muslims, only that they were Islamicized, meaning they started doing is Muslim prayers, but they still continued going to the same places. And some of these traditions continue until today in Bosnia and in other parts of the Balkans. Then number four, the tradition of Islamic reformism or Islah, uh, especially in the 20th century with the rise of the Islamic, the schools of Islamic modernism, they had very strong influence on Islamic thought in the Balkans and in Bosnia. And that's also part of the Islamic tradition of Bosnians. Number five, institutionalization of Islam that I will talk about a little bit later toward the end of my presentation. And finally, practice of Islam in a secular state. All of these constitute what he called Islamic tradition of Bosniaks. When it comes to education, um, there is a long history of Islamic education in the Balkans. I'll give you an example, for instance, of the Ghazi Husra Beg Medrasa in Sarajevo, 1531. So we're only, what, nine years away from it being 500 years old. It's the longest standing, continuously functioning such Islamic school in Europe, probably. Um, in 1881, uh, the College for Sharia Judges was established by the Austro under the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And then in 1977, the Faculty of Islamic Theology that, was, uh, that has been renamed into Faculty of Islamic Studies was established in 1977. There are also many other institutions of Islamic education across the Balkans, in Kosovo, in Albania, in many other places. There are also interesting cultural expressions. Uh, I'll just point a few. Um, point out a few. So for instance, in the month of Ramadan, there is this tradition of what is known as female mukabela, mukabela which is the uh, recitation of the Quran. Uh, many people would know that in the month of Ramadan, Muslims try to finish the recitation of the Quran during the holy month. And in some uh, Bosnian mosques, there is a tradition where only women would get together and they would recite the Quran in the month of Ramadan. There are several mosques in Sarajevo, for instance, the capital city, where this tradition continues even today. Um, here is another example. Um, and uh, there is a book that is coming out very, very soon by Professor Janita Karic on the Bosnian Hajj literature. And this book contains 
a study of 500 years of history of Bosnian um, travel travels and travelogues that talk about the Hajj journey that they took. And as you would imagine, in the past, people would have to traverse long distances on horses and camels in order to get to Mecca to perform Hajj. So um, one of the most interesting stories is the story, and it's really it, and it's on the cover page of the book that's uh, coming out by Edinburgh University Press um, of two uh, Bosnian Muslim women who in the early 1980s actually traveled to Hajj to perform pilgrimage in Mecca by car. So you have these two Bosnian Muslim women driving a uh, Volkswagen Beetle, which you can see on the right side of the actual picture of that car uh, and they drove all the way. So just imagine from the former Yugoslavia, from Bosnia, through Bulgaria, Turkey, Syria, Jordan. And then when they reached Saudi Arabia, they were surprised to see these two women driving. But according to their own testimony, they um, the Saudi authorities gave them permission to go. And they drove all the way to Jeddah. And they came at the outskirts of Mecca where they had to abandon the car because uh, nobody was allowed to drive into Mecca. And so the story of this uh, Hajj journey was published in Bosnian language. And in the book that is coming out very soon, you're going to be able to read more about it. It's, it's such a fascinating story. Uh, I'll finish in a few minutes. These are the last couple of slides that I have. Uh, two things that I want to mention. The first one is the Islamic revival that took place throughout the world globally from the 1917 onwards also was felt in the Balkans. Um, combined with you know, greater liberal, liberalization of the societies in the Balkans, the global waves of democratization, the weakening of socialism, communism, all of that contributed to the rise of Islamic consciousness in the Balkans from the 1917 onwards. Many of the Muslims from the Balkans, in the fifth, in the, especially in the 1960s, went to Western Europe looking for job. Uh, they ended up in Germany, in Switzerland, in, in Austria, in many Western European countries. And uh, as a result, they became, they became more economically empowered and they started sending money back home, some of which was used to construct many new mosques. So in the, in the 60s, 70s, and the 80s, Several hundred new mosques were built in Bosnia, for instance. Uh, we could also see that Islamic revival in personal religiosity, in uh, Islamic education. Remember that 1977, the Faculty of Islamic Theology was established. Um, the greater number of Islamic publication, Muslim social symbols. And this Islamic revival was primarily locally driven. There were some transnational influences, especially in the 1990s during the war and aggression in Bosnia and Kosovo. Uh, but most of it was locally driven. A final word about administration of Islamic affairs in the Balkans. Uh, first of all, it is within a secular environment. Secondly, and this is so important to understand, administration of Islamic affairs in the Balkans is usually separate from the state. So unlike many Muslim majority countries where you find, for instance, um, the Ministry of Religious Affairs or the Ministry of Religious Endowments or something like that. And the government is actually giving money and paying the salaries of the imams and in return, reducing the autonomy of those religious functionaries and leaders. In the Balkans, Islamic communities are usually self-governed and self-funded, which gives them greater autonomy and basically in many ways prevents the state from controlling them. And this is quite different from how things used to be, for instance, in, even under the communist and socialist rule. Uh, so if you look at the Islamic community of Bosnia and Herzegovina that was officially established um, under the Austro-Hungarian Empire, in 1909, a council of ulema, religious scholars was established. And this Islamic community of Bosnia and Herzegovina that is self-governed and for the most part self-funded, survived two world wars an empire, a kingdom, a dictatorship, a communist government, and the aggression against Bosnia and Herzegovina in the 1990s. That points to resiliency, that points to 
um, a great independence, and that points to the vibrancy of this community, which I think works well with the overall argument about Islam on the edges that I have. So to conclude, and this is my final slide, interesting things happen on the margins. First of all, we have these methodological contributions about the Islam on the edges that I hope are going to open new vistas in our study of Islam and Muslims. Uh, when we look at uh, Muslims in the Balkans, we look at the relevance for contemporary Muslims. Um, many of the things that actually are being debated among contemporary Muslims, for instance, the halal food, serving in militaries, and many, many other things have actually been discussed, debated by the Muslims in the Balkans from the 19th century onward. This doesn't mean that those solutions that they propose can be transposed to contemporary experience. But it means that it should be studied and, and their contribution should be understood um, uh, for our contemporary experience. And then, of course, when we're talking about the West and its relationship with Muslims, I think there is so much to be learned from the interactions of the Balkan Muslims with the West and with the European powers um, that points to the ways maybe in which other Muslim communities in the West are going to develop. Not necessarily maybe exactly in the same way, but they can also teach us something about this interaction. So with that, and I, in the hope that I didn't exceed allocated time for this presentation, I'm going to end here. I thank you so much for your attention. Again, thank you so much for this invitation, and I'm looking forward to our Q&A right now. Um, thank you so much, Armin, for that fascinating talk. Uh, if you want to uh, take off, take your PowerPoint off, uh, we can just mm -hmm. start the Q and A. Uh, yes. So while while we're waiting for that, I would like to encourage our audience members to type their questions in the Q and A function at the bottom of your screen. So please go ahead and do that. But I'll start us off. I mean, there's so much to say here. Um, you know, especially. As, as I'm a scholar who is thinking about Islam in a peripheral region too, you know, I study Islam in the Caribbean and Latin America. So a lot of this, um, you know, I struggle with this language too of this of edges, margins, periphery, center, um, who is who is centered and that kind of thing. So I was what um, so I, I'll start us off with two questions. The first one is, how would you how how can we really um think about islam as a decentralized religion um and you know get rid of this language of edges margins periphery when we are so um you know psychically and fit and also you know in terms of prayer too oriented toward mecca um and oriented toward the arab world um how do we um yeah how do we contend with that orientation toward Mecca, um, that is not just that that is that happens in multiple ways. And the second question is that you mentioned that um, there are ways in which the Muslim community adapted to communism and socialism uh, during the Cold War era. So I'd like you to say more about how Islam maybe shifted, adapted during the Cold War era. Yeah. So the first question, um, you know, it's a million dollar question, right? Uh, it's a, it's a great question. I think here, perhaps it would help us if we sort of distinguish two things. There is one which is spiritual centering, which happens, you know, for everybody. And, you know, you're talking about prayer orientation. Um, I think Mujahid Biliji had this wonderful book called Finding Mecca in America, uh, which he published about maybe 10 years ago, maybe longer than that. Um, and so, you know, Mecca is to be found everywhere. That doesn't dispense with the you know, requirement of, of orient prayer orientation, but it also points to the fact that it's a spiritual uh, orientation, which is quite different from what we're talking about when, when we talk about the study of Islam, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, is something different. And that kind of, you know, even the regional orientation that we have, Middle East, Near East, Southeast Asia, South Asia, all those are products of the, of the Cold War. You know, that um, so I think there is a lot of stripping away that needs to be done, both in terms in which we in the West, um, when we study the Muslim world, view those 
you know, the rest of the world. Uh, much of it is still, you know, we still have centers for East European Eurasian studies and so on. All those are Cold War categories. Cold War ended, you know, more than 30 years ago. And um, the, the regional center still didn't get the memo. I understand totally uh, the need for funding and, and why there is a vested interest in continuing that because it brings funding, but it doesn't really help us in understanding. I think this also can be applied, applied to the study of Islam. The second question, uh, so let me just conclude at first actually with one more sentence, and that is the more we study the so-called Islam on the edges, the less there will be need to call it that way and to and to use the center, periphery, edges, margins kind of uh, mm -hmm. uh, terminology. Uh, so I think the more we invest in that type of study, the less the division that we are so far the part of will be apparent and will be dominant in the study of Islam. As far as communism, socialism, there are so many different levels to that. You know, one of them is you know, privatization of religion, uh, when often you, if, if you live in a society where you cannot often display your religiosity publicly, or where even people would be paying attention to who's going to mosque and praying and, and things like that, religion tends to get privatized. It, it tends to go into secrecy. There are different ways of manifesting religion uh, through small acts and so on. Another phenomenon that I've discussed with some of my colleagues, uh, even on my podcast, when I talked about female piety in Bosnia Herzegovina, there is an episode on that. So I hope some of you, uh, some of our participants, will listen to that. Is that, you know, during the communist time, uh, many men ended up working in factories. You know, the the country went from agricultural society predominantly into a more industrial society, and mostly men, some women, but mostly men, ended up going to factories and getting jobs, women were uh, often staying home and they were the ones who actually taught religion to their right. kids. Uh, and so I, I think there is some research that is coming out also on this aspect as well. And there's so much more to be said, but um, it's a big, big topic. And I think we have a lot of questions from the audience too. So we I do, we probably, do. So yeah. We Let's probably get... need to turn to them as well. <laughs> yes. so I hope that this answered at least partly your concerns, and it's something that obviously is much broader than the time allows us. Mm -hmm. Yes, no, thank you very much. So um, our first question that we'll go to is from Professor Gottfried Hagen, who is the director of the Armenian Studies Center here. Uh, so Gottfried asks, in his highly influential What is Islam?, Shahab Ahmed includes the Balkans in a cultural area he calls Balkans to Bengal complex, and which he describes as critically shaped by Persian mystical poetry, most prominently Hafiz of Shiraz and represented in the Sufi orders. Another more popular form used to be represented in the Bektashi order in Albania, Macedonia, and Kosovo. Can you talk about the role this form of Islamic religiosity and institutions play in the Balkans today? Yeah, thank you so much for that question. Yeah, the Balkans to Bengal complex um, is, is a very interesting concept that Shahab Ahmed introduced. I also like somebody else had used uh, from Mali to Bali. And I like that even better because it's a little bit wider and a little bit yeah, more like inclusive. That. And it rhymes too, you know, so you can use it in hip hop and whatnot, you know. Um, as far as these uh, popular expression of religiosity are concerned, so yeah, there are many Sufi orders in the Balkans. Now, of course, under the, under communism, and, and this also goes back to your question, Alia, is uh, many of these uh, Sufi orders were either prohibited or because of the overall pressure against religious communities, um, they, many of these sort of dwindled. They, they shrank in their um, numbers and so on. Some of these, orders really, even though they were widespread in the Balkans. And I would say that it probably in Albania, in Northern Macedonia and in Kosovo, uh, probably in Kosovo and Northern Macedonia, they, they remained stronger than in Bosnia and definitely stronger than Albania because Albania at one point adopted not only communism, 
but actually put atheism in its constitution. Mm -hmm. It was the only officially atheist uh, state in the world. And that obviously had tremendous implications for the way in which the state interacted with. So these popular expressions of religiosity, um, especially, you know, uh, so the Bektashi orders, uh, they are not very prevalent in Bosnia, much more in Albania, Macedonia, and Kosovo, as you have rightly noted. Uh, but there are also many others, Nakshabendis, the Qadiris, uh, the Rifais, they are all present. And uh, we've seen since the 1990s, uh, a sort of a revival of these Sufi orders in, in the Balkans as well. Maybe not yet at the, uh, at the level that they used to be in the past, but I think more and more people are becoming uh, aware of the Sufi tradition and Sufi heritage. Uh, in the Balkans, uh, there is a lot, a lot of practitioners, a lot of academic studies, um, and uh, I would say that probably in the case of the Balkans, the poetry of uh, Rumi was probably more influential than, than Hafiz of Shiraz, even though I, I would say Hafiz was probably more influential in Central Asia um, than he was in, in the Balkans. In the Balkans, I think Rumi and the Memlevis uh, were quite, um, historically, were quite present. So that's about the extent to which I can engage with question uh, this time. Right. I mean, it's very interesting that the Balkans is, so people in the Balkans are so drawn to Sufism when you think about other strains of Islamic revivalism that are more prominent elsewhere um, and how they, uh, yeah. Okay, so we have another question here from Hadil Ghanayim. Uh, who asks, it appears that Muslims in the Balkans are sort of isolated, and our latest memory of Bosnia, for example, was the vicious ethnic war that took place in the 90s. What is the state of current relations now between the Balkan nations and communities? A very broad, complicated question. Mm -hmm. What about relations with Muslim countries outside of Europe, like Turkey, yeah. Egypt, Tunisia, Saudi Arabia, and even further, uh, Iran and Indonesia? Yeah, that's a very, very broad question, you know. Um, so historically, obviously, there was a lot of relation with the Ottomans, later on with Turkey, uh, but that relationship sort of was severed in many ways. And I think the Austro-Hungarian Empire had a very strong uh, policy on trying, the one of the reasons, for instance, why they created an, an autonomous Islamic community in Bosnia and Herzegovina, sort of religious hierarchy or administrative body, was to separate Muslims uh, in the Balkans, especially in the Bos in Bosnia, because they were not really uh, uh, ruling over other Muslim Balkan communities from Istanbul, mm -hmm. you know, and to create their own religious hierarchy. Now. In the 20th century, in the 60s and the 70s, you know, Alia, you and I talked about this before. Uh, Yugoslavia was part of the non-aligned movement. And the Arab countries had very important uh, presence, including Indonesia also, in, in the non-aligned movement and other Muslim countries as well. And so through that, some of the relationships and linkages were established. You know, some of the Muslims from the Balkans studied, especially from Yugoslavia, in Egypt, and in other places as a result of those close relationships. And then from the 1990s onwards, after the you know aggression against the Muslims in the Balkans, we find um, uh, many Muslim countries trying to help. And that's where a lot of linkages were established with Iran, for instance, was an important. Iran actually provided, and this is public knowledge, the weapons to Bosnia with the Americans turning a blind eye to that because at that time there was embargo. Um, Malaysia helped tremendously. Um, other Muslim countries, Saudi Arabia helped a great deal, but they also, some of them tried to introduce their own brand of Islam. And that's what you, I think, hinted at when you said other brands of Islamic revival. You know, that's in the 1990s, you start seeing Salafi influences in Bosnia, you know. At one point, they sort of grew a little bit and there was concern about it. But over time, they, they again, they were on decline and continue to be on the decline. There was small Salafi presence in Bosnia, but by and large, most of the Muslims there do not, do not buy into it. Um, the relationship between the Balkan communities, uh, the Muslim communities of the Balkans, relatively good, 
but they all are trying on the one hand to establish their own nationhood, like Kosovo, Bosnia, and so on. And on the other, they try to integrate themselves into Europe. Um, and that sometimes creates this movement or dynamics where they are trying to balance between their pro-European orientation on the one hand, and the fact that they are Muslims are that, that they would like to have some kind of connection with the Muslim world. Uh, but they don't want it too much because they don't want to be a, a they don't want to appear too Muslim in the eyes of Europeans because they all eventually want to become part of the European Union. So it's a kind of a delicate balance that they are trying to achieve. And again, it's such a huge question, but I mm -hmm. hope this answers at least a little bit of it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Idina Selimovic. And that is, would you say, a related question, would you say that the aggression of Bosnian Serbs, as well as the Serbian state today toward Bosniaks, has a lot to do with their response to Ottoman colonization, and they're bringing upon a larger influence, and they're bringing a larger influence of Islam, and the conversion of a large amount of the population, alongside trying to continue a Christian Europe philosophy? So, yeah. I yeah. Mean yeah, so that Ottoman relationship, yeah, yeah, the Ottomans. Well, I've already, I think, mentioned during the presentation that these nationalistic or national programs in the Balkans often included very strong anti-Ottoman, anti-Muslim sentiment, right? And so I have written elsewhere that, for instance, for Serbian Orthodox Church, one of the three pillars of the Serbian Orthodox Church is what. Michael Sells at the University of Chicago called Christ, uh, Christoslavism, where, uh, you know, kind of a Serbian Orthodox Church position is that the Slavs in that region were originally all Christians, and by nature they should be Christians. Those that became Muslims have sort of left their Christian faith and as such are renegades, you know. Um, mm -hmm. The, the kafirs, if you will, they are murtads. They are, you know, to be not only ex excommunicated, but they are to be fought against, if you will. So there is that element within Serbian nationalism, a Serbian Orthodox Church. It doesn't mean all of them accept that, but it's been a strong element of the Serbian Orthodox Church, which has in many ways fueled anti-Muslim hatred and violence that we had seen in uh, that we had seen in uh, in in former Yugoslavia and especially in Bosnia and Kosovo. I think you're muted, Alia. Oh, thank you for that. It's so interesting that so much of the political thought in this region of the world is still so embedded in Ottoman colonization and the mm. legacy of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, we have a somewhat related question from Dilara Kaya who asks, were there any threads of the existence of Muslim communities and them staying quote unquote religious Muslims and not adapting too much to Christians, maybe because of the genocide and forcing of conversion to Christianity. I also heard of a survivor of the genocide in Srebrenica and before the genocide, um, were they too adaptive and almost losing their Islamic culture and collective Iman? Would you agree on that? So something, so so something to paraphrase here yeah. about um, just how religious and how Muslim were these yeah. Muslim communities? Were by and large they were by the 1990s when the war broke out in Yugoslavia they were very very deeply secularized. Okay, they're deeply secularized. Um, by and large, most of the Muslims in the area did not really practice Islam in, in the way that you would usually associate the practice of Islam, you know, like regular prayers and fasting in Ramadan and things of that nature. Um, uh, many other manifestations of Islamic religion, attendance in the mosques, you know, I know anecdotally, even from people in my own community, they would say that prior to 1990s, even if you went to a Friday prayer, which, you know, is the communal prayer, the Juma prayer, you would probably find like 10, 15 people in, in, a, in a town maybe that has five or 10,000 Muslims, you know. Situation now is very, very different, you know. Now, you you know, if you had the one mosque in the town, now maybe you have two or three, and Fridays, most of them are pretty filled up, you know. So that 
that points to the way in which there was that religious revival in some ways. But yeah, I, I would say that by and large, they were very secularized um, and that uh, many uh, Muslims remained Muslims in name only. Mm -hmm. uh, and even that wasn't enough to save them from, from the, uh, the outcome that they, that they received because even having a Muslim name was deemed by some as too much of a Muslim, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so yeah very deeply secularized site and still continues to be. I mean, I think when you look at all the surveys that have been done uh, in the region, um, it's a small number of people that uh, maybe 10 to 20% that, you know, kind of habitually practice on a regular basis religion. The vast majority do not. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Uh, we have a somewhat, also somewhat related, um, large ongoing question about language politics in the former Yugoslavia from Katarina Borer, who writes, nice presentation, Dr. Sinalovic, thank you. Here is my question. I was born in Bosnia while it was part of Yugoslavia. The language I spoke and still do was called Serbo-Croatian. I used it in Bosnia, Croatia, and Serbia. Except for some Turkisms in the Bosnian version and slight difference in pronunciation of vowels, I see no difference in the basic language. Since 1990s, there is now an argument that Bosnian, Croatian, and Serbian are separate and distinct languages. Um, can you explain, please? <laughs> My maiden name was uh, Tom Ljenovic. Tom Ljenovic, yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Katarina, for this question. Yeah, it's a, it's a big one, you know. Um, I also grew up um, in Yugoslavia, and we called it Serbo-Croatian. But I think uh, as a part of, you know, the Bosnians were latecomers to kind of nationalist awakening in the Balkans, you know, compared to the to Serbs and Croats and uh, some other uh, ethnic or national groups. And so when that national awakening happened, a lot of people realized that in the past, there were periods when the, when the language that they spoke was called Bosnian language. And so the question was, why was this language called Serbo-Croatian and not Serbo-Croatian Bosnian, for instance? You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of cumbersome, right? And so right now, what you have in Bosnia is that you have three official languages, Bosnian, Serbian, Croatian. In reality, in essence, they are the same language. So I would grant that. I personally view, and it probably more, you know, some more nationalistic Bosnians would not agree with me that they're all the same language. At the same time, as a Bosnian, I don't wanna call my language Serbian or Croatian mm -hmm. or Serbo-Croatian even, um, why not? Uh, so I don't think anyone should impose on anybody how that language should be called. If Serbs wanna call it Serbian, they should. If Croats should call it Croatian, they should. And many people in Bosnia call it Bosnian, um, they should call it Bosnian. Keeping in mind that in essence, it's one language, you know? And so if it's not one language, you could say, that why don't we have one name for it? If you could find the people of former Yugoslavia to agree on it, I would sign on to it right now. But you know that presently that's not going to happen. So I think anybody can call it whatever they want. If you just keep in mind that it's essentially the same language with some you know, dialects here and there. And you know, you mentioned Tursism uh, in the Bosnian version, you know, there are probably more Tursisms in Serbian language than in Bosnian, you know, um, and, and some people have studied that even. But yeah, um, if you want to continue calling it Serbo-Croatian, that's absolutely your right, and uh, that's the language that you learned when you were when you know you were a child and you were in school. If other people want to call it just Bosnian or just Croatian, just Serbian, I think uh, you know it is their right. Mm -hmm. But it's the same language. I would agree with that. Mm -hmm. I mean, one sees a very similar case in the fragmentation of um, Hindustani into very distinctly mm -hmm. Hindi and Urdu, right? And it, yeah. it, it's not that it's not the same, mutually intelligible with the same basis and so forth, but it has much more to do with ethno-linguistic politics. Yeah, it is exactly. It's ethno-linguistic politics, but in the case of Bosnian, Croatian, and Serbian, I mean, they are virtually indistinguishable. I mean, mm -hmm. yes, you can point out if somebody from Croatia is speaking, oh yeah, he's from Croatia, that guy's from Serbia, but they absolutely fully understand each other. They speak the same, um, it's the same language essentially. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have a question um, from someone who asks how, I, I suppose, thinking about revivalism in, of Islam in Bosnia, um, how common is the hijab in Bosnia and the Balkans? And I guess we can ask, has that changed over time? Yeah. So, you know, up till the end of the World War II, it wasn't uncommon, especially in, in urban areas, to see women in Bosnia wearing full facial cover you know, a version of niqab or, um, you know, they called it feraja or, you know, pacha or something like that. Uh, pecha, I'm sorry. Um, but then there was, um, after the World War II with the communist government, there was a law that basically outlawed uh, wearing a full facial cover. Now, in more rural areas, many women continued wearing a headscarf even if they were not practicing often, you know, it was kind of part of tradition and culture and whatnot. But with the revival, especially from the 1990s onwards, we see that among the younger population, there is some, um, again, reinstitution of hijab among um, younger women. So it's not uncommon to see it in areas where Muslims live in Bosnia, but it would still be, I don't have the numbers, but it would still, still be very, very small number of women that wear hijab in Bosnia. Uh, but definitely more than before, and definitely you find much younger population today. You know, hijab used to be associated with older rural women, you know, mm -hmm. who, as I said, many times were not even practicing. It was just kind of part of that tradition. But nowadays you have younger women who are adopting the practice of wearing hijab and they're doing it, you know, for a variety of reasons that I think it's better to ask women why, why they wear it. Of course, I've read the studies and I know there are multiple reasons why they wear it or not, but, um, but that's, um, that's uh, how it is today. Yeah. I mean, that trend is true in the United States and in many places in the world that it's younger women that are adopting it. Uh, we have a question from Arnila Bogdanich, uh, who asks, who, how do you feel about the ethnonym Bosniak and also the expansion of who is considered a Bosniak? Yeah, so I guess the question is, so the Bosniak was a name that again, historically was used often Bosniak or Bosnian in, in, in our language, you know, in Bosnian language. <laughs> um, for people who lived in Bosnia and uh, was often used not only for Muslims, but for Bosnians of Orthodox or Catholic background as well. At some point with the awakening of Serbian and Croatian nationalism, pretty much all Catholics became Croats, all Orthodox Christians became Serbs. Uh, and then the name Bosniak just disappeared only to be revived in the 1990s by primarily the Muslims of Bosnia Herzegovina who have since adopted that ethnic name for themselves, you know, mm -hmm. so they would call themselves Bosniak. I think it is an inclusive uh, term that could potentially include other Bosnians as well who are not of Muslim faith or they could be atheists, they could be Catholic, they could be orthodox but i think at this moment in history there is really very little chance that a great number of people who are not traditionally muslim not come from traditional muslim background would adopt that kind of uh name for themselves so there could be a few of those who are not muslims who would adopt the name bosniak but i think by now the process of ethnic identities has been pretty much mm. completed in Bosnia. So I think it is a, is a term that has potential, but I don't think it's realistic to expect that it would expand much outside the Muslim community in Bosnia. Interesting. Uh, we have a question from someone who asks, uh, relatedly, how can we make the discussion of Muslims from the Balkans more mainstream? so that they are considered when people talk about European Muslims, which, you know, this is a great question because, you know, you brought, you brought this up at the beginning and that some ways immigrant Muslims to Europe are who people think of when they think of Muslims, yeah. Yeah, immigrants from the Middle East, Africa, not indigenous Muslims yeah. like Bosnians. 
Well, isn't it the same in the United States, though? You know, when people think right. of Muslims, they do not think of African American Muslims often right. who have been around for centuries, but they think of mostly Muslims of immigrant origins, like myself, you know, who have been around only for a few decades, you know, in the United States. So, yeah, it, it is very interesting. So, there are two ways of doing that. One would be um, to, uh, you know, to invest in these studies to and invest in new ways of studying about uh, Muslims in the Balkans. Um, it could be, it could start with donating huge amounts of money to your center, Ali, or to mine. You know, mm -hmm. I wouldn't, I wouldn't complain about that. <laughs> but uh, nice plug. <laughs> but more importantly, I think it's about self-representation. So I think the Muslims of the Balkans need to represent themselves, need to actually not wait for people from the United States or Germany or France to come and study the Muslims in the Balkans. The Muslims in the Balkans are absolutely capable of producing those studies, and they should do it in the languages that are you know, used globally. So talking about English, other languages as well where people would have access. You know, there is a lot of knowledge that is being produced in vernacular languages in the Balkans. We have a lot of literature, many studies, books about Islam in Bosnia, in Bosnian language. But we don't have as, you know, nearly as many in English. So mm -hmm. we need to translate many of those works. We need to write studies in English because that is the language that most people now use. And if we do that, if we self-represent, whether we are Bosnians, Albanians, you know, Bulgarian Muslims, Greek Muslims, and whatnot, I think then uh, that self-representation would create uh, hopefully a better understanding of Islam in that part of the world. Mm -hmm. And perhaps self-representation is what mitigates um, the assertion that you made about demographics being a problem for Muslims mm -hmm. in Europe. That's such an interesting idea, right? That like just yeah. a factual statement of demographics is dangerous. Yeah, yeah, it is, it is. You know, sometimes you, you feel like every, I'll tell you honestly, every time I say that there is like 51% of Muslims in Bosnia, I feel something, I'm like, man, somebody's gonna hear this and take it wrongly, you know? It's almost like, yeah, it's 51%, but how about we say it's 35, you know, it sounds better. And that's, you know, it's, it's, it's horrible that you have to feel that way. But, uh, you know, informed by the historical experience, that's how a lot of people feel, you know. I would have actually assumed that the Bosnia, the percentage of Muslims in Bosnia is higher than 51. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, no, actually, it, it, it used to be lower than that even, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, we have a question from Ubeid Roof um, who asks, is there evidence that the neglect of the Balkans uh, perhaps in discourse of Muslims in Europe is coordinated. For example, in Turkey, we see that many anti-Osmani articles are cut and paste and very well coordinated and spread. I don't know. I have no knowledge about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, we have a, uh, actually two comments rather than questions, if you'd like to respond from let me just put them in for everyone to see, from Azra Duric, um, who says two things. Um, first, Bosnian language, I uh, wanted to make a point that Bosnian language existed before Croatian and Serbian, but in 1907, it was banned and called Serbo-Croatian. And then another note that the war in Bosnia in the 1990s was not an ethnic war, but aggression of Serbia against Bosnia and genocide committed on Bosnian Muslims. And the point here is that it is important to use correct naming of events. I don't know if you want to, um, you know. No, I mean, I, I fully agree. And I think I've used uh, the word aggression and, the, the, you know, all of that, the attack of Serbia and Bosnia throughout and, and so on. And yeah, the word Bosnian language is not new. I mean, the, uh, at, at least to the extent that we know, uh, the first dictionary that we have of uh, Turkish or the Ottoman Bosnian language was written in 1631 or something like that. So the word Bosnian language, the use of Bosnian language for the language that we speak goes, you know, at least four, maybe even more centuries back. So th mm -hmm. that's what I said. When people in the 1990s with the revival of Bosnian national identity, people realized that this name was used in the past. Like when I was growing up, we didn't know that this language was ever called Bosnian. Mm -hmm. I never heard that. But it was later 
that we were introduced to many older studies that have pointed out that the word Bosnian language was used many, many centuries before. So, um, but in essence, those languages that we call Bosnian, Croatian, Serbian is the same language. The question of naming it is a political question. I don't think it's right. going to be resolved and each community and each country has the right to call it whichever they, way they want. Right. Um, we have time for one more question, one or two more questions. Um, uh, a good question to end on. How do you see the future of Islam in Bosnia? <laughs> um, uh, that's a tough one. You know, um, you know, Bosnia is losing population uh, dramatically um, for a number of reasons. There is a huge uh, emigration out of Bosnia. Um, every year, Bosnia loses tens of thousands of people. Um, in 1991, the census uh, in Bosnia-Herzegovina showed 4.2 million people. 2013 census, 20 years later, 3.5 million. That's 700,000 loss. But in reality, many people believe that a lot of people who live outside Bosnia have been counted in that census. And that in reality, Bosnia currently does not have more than 2.7, 2.8 million people. That's 1.5 million mm -hmm. or about 30, 35% loss in the last 30 years. So I think the future of Islam in Bosnia is very much related to demographics, the immigration or emigration out of Bosnia. And, uh, and for that reason, it's very, very hard to answer, you know. Uh, I think the is Islamic institutions in Bosnia are, are very strong. They are uh, well developed, but the question is: If you're losing population, if you're losing people, can they survive in the long run? And that's something that I don't think anyone has the answer to. But uh, the trends are pointing in a negative direction, and so we'll see. We will see. Uh, so thank you so much to Dr. Sinanovic for his presentation today, for a super interesting presentation today. And as a reminder, if you want to hear first about similar events from us, please subscribe to our newsletter. Thank you so much to our audience uh, for being here today and, and tuning in to JISC events. Um, and that Once is it. again, thank you for having me. It was wonderful talking to you and uh, to your audience. And I was happy that, you know, we were able to do it. Thanks again. Thank you so much to everybody. Have a good evening. Bye.